Two months ago, we did a live stream unboxing, assembly, and first print on the Creality Ender 7 over on the ModBot Army YouTube channel that Creality had sent us to review. And during the assembly, it was fairly straightforward. Things went well, and there were some definite things that I liked right away, like the really nice cable management, the beefy extrusions, and the linear rails for the X and Y axis, to name a few. Firing up a test print that came on the micro SD card during that stream, it started off pretty underwhelming with the first couple of layers, but once it hit sort of the fourth or fifth layer, and as it was doing the infill, I got to really see the machine whipping back and forth quicker than most FDM printers that I've seen, which is sort of what the Ender 7 was advertised as, a machine that can hit 250 millimeters a second, which is what I'm assuming they had sliced this file at. I've had plenty of time over the past couple of months here to sort of probe at the Ender 7 and see what the machine is uh, capable of, and it's been quite an interesting experience. So in today's video, I will do what I normally do for reviews, which is go over the machine specs. We will talk a little bit more about the unboxing and setup. We will take a look at some of the prints that came off the machine, and then I will go over the things I like, the things I don't like, and then give you my conclusion on the Ender 7. So, with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right to today's video. Starting off, let's run through the specs of the Ender 7. The Ender 7 has a build volume of 250 by 250 by 300 millimeters and uses a Core XY motion system, which is something that I'm really excited to see. It is Creality's second Core XY machine, with the first one being their Ender 6. The machine is primarily constructed of three beefy aluminum extrusion pillars with a steel frame on top for the motion system. The X and Y axis uses linear rails, while the Z axis on the bed uses V-slot wheels and rides up and down on a single lead screw. The bed is made of the glass ultra base style bed found on many of the current Crowdy printers, and it has manual bed leveling with four large knobs on each corner of the bed. The Ender 7 has a Bowden extruder. It is one of Crowdy's upgraded red aluminum dual geared extruders. The hot end is not all metal and it's not quite a volcano, but does have a slightly larger heat block and nozzle throat for increased material flow. The hot end housing has three fans with one for cooling the heatsink and two for the layer cooling. Interfacing with the Ender 7 is done through the four inch touchscreen on the front where you can print files from a micro SD card. There's also a USB-C port, which is pretty cool to see, that will allow you to hook your printer up to your computer or OctoPrint. It is a 24 volt system running what I believe is Marlin. I did not see any mention of it on their website. I looked around for the source code without any luck. I cracked open the bottom of the printer to take a look at the electronics, which is where I found a 350 watt Creality branded power supply a 32-bit Creality board labeled 2.4.S1, which seems to be a brand new Creality board, and some huge stepper motors. I've never seen anything like these used on 3D printers before. The stepper drivers are labeled DM542, and they're used to power the beefy 4260 stepper motors on this machine, which are also the largest stepper motors I've seen used on a 3D printer so far. Everything is routed nicely, and there is a blower fan next to the main board to help with removing heat. The Ender 7 showed up packaged very nicely in a box that was quite heavy, and that's partly due to the Ender 7 weighing close to 40 pounds. As mentioned, the entire machine was assembled on live stream, so I can place links in the description over to that. We actually do weekly live streams over there, so if you're not subscribed to the ModBot Army channel, definitely go do that. And the build took about an hour on stream. I would say if you're Concentrated, it's probably a 30 minute build and it's definitely not very difficult. Standouts from the build was that this machine has very, very nice cable management. I really like the strain relief and how the cables are routed nicely through a single braid and there's these clips to hold it into the extrusions. They definitely did a great job on that. Also, this machine is very, very beefy as far as the aluminum extrusions go. The side pillars are 4040s and the back is made up of, I believe, 32040s. So there is quite a bit of aluminum on this printer. I quickly discovered that the Ender 7 is a very loud 3D printer. It's probably one of the louder 3D printers I've tested out in some time. Part of it's due to the many fans that are on this machine and the other portion of it is those really large stepper motors and those external stepper motor drivers are just not quiet. The last thing from the stream was again that test print that we ran which ended up being roughly six hours and once I got a chance to really look at it, the filament I used kind of does a good job of hiding some of the imperfections but in the light I was able to see some under extrusions, some clear blobs and a little bit of sort of banding it looked like that was going on but 
Being that it was the first print and I could see that it was obviously, again, printing very quickly, I was optimistic that with some slicer tweaking, I would be able to get this machine dialed in with much better looking prints. Hopping over to the computer, I installed the included Creality Slicer, which is just a fork or skinned version of Cura. The default speeds in the Ender 7 profile were 20 millimeters per second for the first layer, so nothing fast really, 80 millimeters a second for the perimeters, and 250 millimeters a second for the infill. That 250 millimeters a second was pushed very heavily in the Ender 7's marketing, and if you go to the product page, you can kind of see it plastered at least a couple times on there. And through my digging, I did discover that the Ender 7 only has its acceleration set to 500, so realistically, in its current form, there is no way that you're going to be getting anywhere near those speeds, especially because the parts that you're printing, the machine's just not going to have enough of a runway, if you will, to even hit those speeds at all. So I do think that the 250 millimeters per second was more of a marketing ploy. Uh, given the rigidity of this machine and the fact that it's a Core XY, I do think that it should and can print a bit quicker than some other machines, but if you're thinking you're going to get this machine and again, you're going to be actually hitting those 250 millimeters a second, you're not. That being said, I was still very excited to see what the machine was capable of and the added speed benefit was something that I was excited for because I do have some pretty, pretty large uh, printing projects that I'm working on. So I went ahead and loaded up a tray of parts that I was going to be printing out of PLA, hit print, and that is where the trouble started. I watched the first layer go down like I typically do with most prints and I adjusted the four bed leveling knobs because it was a full tray and I just wanted to make sure that everything was looking good and it was, the first layer actually didn't look bad at all. And so I stepped away and I came back maybe 20 minutes later to the sound of the nozzle grinding on the infill of the previous layer. And I thought that was a bit odd because again, I had looked at the first layer and it was going down perfectly. And the fact that it was PLA, I just didn't think that it could be, you know, some serious warping issue that would have caused that. So I killed the print, figured let's just try this again, hit restart and the same thing ended up happening. So I did it a third time, but the third time I sat here and watched it every second for the first 20 minutes to see what was going on. And it was really odd. It, it seemed like the prints it would start off great, and then as each layer would go, it seemed like the nozzle was digging in more and more. So the first layer was great, then it looked like the nozzle was too close. It was super too close. It's way too close. And so my initial thoughts was maybe that there was something off with the Z axis and that it wasn't turning as much as it should be, you know, each layer as the print should be dropping down. It also felt to me a little bit like it could be sort of extrusion related. Like I saw certain areas where it was sort of under extruding and other portions where maybe it was over extruding. So I, I began the troubleshooting process. For the Z axis, I started off with checking the eccentric nuts to make sure that they were fine and they were nice and tight. Then I went and checked the Z axis coupler to make sure that the set screw wasn't loose on either of the uh, motor side or on the lead screw side. Everything checked out there. And then I even jogged the printer up and down a couple times to see if there was any sort of bumps or, or non, you know, any section that wasn't smooth and I didn't see any issues at all with the Z axis. Then I turned my attention to the extruder where I checked to make sure that the tension was correct on the screw and the spring. And I even went as far as calibrating the E-steps, which is not something I normally do on a stock machine like that, but it, it seemed to make a slight difference, but very, very minimal. And I proceeded to print a couple of benches out that I played around with different settings, but they had high levels of stringing, zits, and again, uh, different sections of under extrusion and then other sections where it seemed slightly over extruded. I typically use my sort of default settings for most materials that I have, but in this case, because I really, really, really wanted to see if it was just temperamental or what the deal was, I went as far as doing temp towers uh, for a couple different materials where I determined that for PLA, it seems like 210 was a sweet spot. I did a couple of different retraction tests or retraction towers to determine the speed and the distance that seemed to work the best. And still, if it wasn't bulging or under extrusion, I just couldn't get a what I would consider good looking print off of this machine. But I was not ready to give up yet. So I took the Bowden tube out of the hot end. I cut the end to make sure that it was going to be nice and flat and insert it back inside of the hot end. I swapped the nozzle out with the replacement nozzle that they included with the printer. I slowed the speeds down heavily to see if maybe it just couldn't keep up with the profile that they had built in. 
Uh, and I even used a completely different profile. I went over to Prusa Slicer and tried that out with no luck. And I did print out quite a few things. So I will show you all of those different things or you're seeing them right now to see, you know, what the quality was like coming off of this machine. I tried a couple of PLAs to make sure that it wasn't, you know, a defective spool of PLA that I had. Then I thought, well, maybe it's got some sort of a heat creep issue going on. So I threw on some PTG thinking that if I printed on the lower temperature side of PTG, if it was heat creep, I wouldn't see those issues. But PETG definitely didn't do any better. I have a rule for myself that if I plan on reviewing a printer or if I have a printer in that's going to be reviewed, I won't watch any other creator's videos on that printer until after I'm done. And the reason for that is because I like to have my own experience and I don't want it to be influenced with whether me knowing it or not by anything I've seen that's not my own experience. And then afterwards, I typically like to compare my experience to other people's and see, hey, how did it align or how did it differ? But I made an exception this time because I really wanted to see whether I just had a lemon or something was seriously wrong and what the quality looked like from other people that were printing and showing off prints on the Ender 7. I must have watched five different videos on this printer and based off what I saw, it's not just my printer. That seems to be the quality that the Ender 7 is putting out. And I checked out the 3D Print General's channel and he was showing it off that the, the print quality was definitely subpar and yes, it can print fast and it can whip out a part, but it doesn't look good. I don't really feel it's very dimensionally accurate either. So I'm not exactly sure how good or what good that is. And the other, the other videos I saw too were the same way. When I looked at them, there was splits, there was blobs, there was all sorts of stuff. And the only ones that I, I couldn't, uh, the only ones that weren't like that were ones where I just couldn't tell because either the filament was sort of a translucent one where it, it hid some of the imperfections or maybe the camera didn't have a really close up shot. But every one that I saw that was really close up of the prints coming off the Ender 7 looked really similar to what I've been experiencing. And it's super disappointing because the Ender 7 is a $700 3D printer. And so I was at least expecting it to be this Core XY that was going to have uh, quality, print quality on par with at least their previous generation of printers, but that just doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like the only real emphasis was speed and which is why they've, you know, went with the larger belts and bulky uh, motors and the large drivers, but there was no emphasis on quality at all. If you're currently looking for a Core XY printer that isn't a full kit build and you were hoping that for 700 bucks you were going to get a Core XY that would be super quick, have nice prints and not require a bunch of modding, then I cannot recommend the Ender 7. I don't know definitively, but my hunch is that the issue lies somewhere in the hot end design on this machine because the actual extruder itself is sort of just their standard aluminum dual geared. And so I don't see that being the main issue. I really think it has something to do inside with the hot end design that they went with. I do actually have plans for this machine though. It's going to be some time, but the plan is to throw clipper on it, to get rid of the Bowden extruder and get rid of their hot end and mount something like an LGX with either a Revo or a Rapido or a Dragonfly hot end to turn it into a direct drive core XY system. Because I think that you get that, you get rid of the hot end and extruder issue that's been going on. and the machine's rigid, the, the frame is rigid, it's got linear rails. I think that it does have the potential to be a beast of a machine. It's just disappointing that again, out of the box, it, it's just not there. If Creality is able to resolve whatever's going on with the extrusion, which again, I think is related to this new hot end design they went with on this machine, and they were to throw on some sort of automatic bed leveling that was consistent, then I think the Ender 7 does have the, the, the potential to be a really solid Core XY machine. And, and if you are someone that does enjoy tinkering and you are looking for a Core XY machine and you don't want to do a full kit, but you're okay with taking this machine and hacking it up and at least the hot end and the extruder, I do think that it could still make for a solid base for a project without having to do every single portion of it. But again, that's really the only scenario I think right now that I would recommend the Ender 7. Let me know in the comments down below if you're interested on me doing a follow-up. It would probably be a few months when I do have Clipper installed and the different extruder and hot end and kind of showing off what it's actually capable of doing and performance and print quality with those mods and also let me know in the comments down below what you think of this printer. I, I will say that I've been testing out the Creality Ender 3 S1 which I'll have a video on in 
a monthish or so, and so far it has been a night and day difference in terms of the experience. And the S1 has been great, while the Ender 7 was a very, very frustrating experience. And that is the Ender 7. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll place links down below in the description over to our Patreon where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.